Hello, this is Miss Howington from Research Triangle High School. Um, today we are going to read The True Acts, which is kind of a, a parody or a response to The Lorax. Um, so, here we go. The True Acts by Terry Burkett. A warm day in June, way out on Oak Knoll, with my saw and my axe hung up on a pole, I was fixing a wheel on my board flipping packer when I glimp when I glimpsed what I thought was a green-crusted quacker. I looked to the sky. That wasn't a bird. It looked like a green-crusted man. How absurd! He was drifting along, just riding the breeze, when below him he heard the clink of my keys. Mister, he yelled with a whiskey wheeze, whiskery wheeze, I am Guardbark, protector of trees. With one eye, Squinted eye, he sized up my clothes, my axe, my saw, my steel toed, my steel booted toes. Hello, Mr. Guardbark, I said with unease, and not to be rude, I got off my knees. <clears throat> he must have been flying for quite a long while. He seemed kind of sad, so I said with a smile, I welcome you here to where the loblolly grows and the roots of the shade grove tickle your toes, where the shrub bird sings and hums out his nose, and the blue-breasted bark peckers peck out the rose. I am the true axe, the logger. I harvest the trees, for ball bats and houses and things such as these. But before I could shake or offer a seat, the guard bark stopped, stiffened, and stamped his two feet. Sir, he said loudly, you are grisly with greed. Cutting hagbarks is mean, a horrible, a horribus deed. Look what a mess your hacking has made. You did all of this just to get your bills paid? No, not all, I said with a smile. Have a seat on that pile. This might take a while. I won't take a seat or listen or look, the guard bark raved on. He snarled and he shook. I am guard bark, I tell you. Keeper of trees, our future, you know, is dependent on these. You must stop this hacking and whacking and stacking. You should not be here. I must send you packing. Whoa, Mr. Guardbark, just calm down a bit. Our trees won't be helped by a fumulous fit. Let's talk instead. As I've always said, talking is much better than losing your head. Okay, we'll talk you brutish tree whacker. Turn off your saw and your wood hacking stacker. I turned off my saw and my stacker, and soon we could hear the shrill call of the leaf sucking loon. When the guard bark, then guard bark began. I'm angry, all right. What future is there with no trees in sight? Trees clean the air, give shrub birds a rest. Fuzz worms and kite squirrels use trees for their nests. Oh, Mr. Guardbark, you're right, I agreed. No trees for the future would be dreadful indeed. That's why I carry my bag of tree seeds and my dirt-digging planter to plant them with speed. In fact, for every one tree that I need, I plant five food-stowing, tree-growing seeds. My friends do all the same all over this land, six million a day. It's part of the plan. When some years ago, just this past May, we had half the trees that are growing today. We worked really hard to manage our trees, to keep lots of them growing and free from disease. Guardbark pondered this last bit of news while chewing his fingernails off by the twos. So you really plant trees for all the trees that you use? Still, that won't remove my tree-hacking blues. He looked rather gloomy. There, shaking his head, I guessed he must not know the truth. So I said, back in the 30s, with wildfires unchecked, millions of acres of forest were wrecked. Then people began pitching in and fight, began to pitch in and fight the fires that began from big lightning strikes. Now every year, 49 million acres of trees are spared from this lawless tree taker. Guardbark muttered, cocked his head to one side, 
and rubbed his chin as he thought. Then he sighed. But what about the trees that are really quite old, that are cooling our planet and shouldn't be sold? They're cleaning our air. It's not really fair to cut them down for some wobblesome chair. I realized that Guardbark did not did not want to know how the earth keeps changing, so I spoke sort of slow. With wildfires and wind, insects and disease, nature herself renews stands of old trees. I looked at the guard bark, his mouth turned to gristle. His eyes shot some darts, his nose whirred a whistle. But nature is patient and willing to wait. I want old trees now. It's the wait that I hate. I agreed with guard bark that it is always good to save some of the old historical wood. Then I gave him the facts, the truth of the matter. This guard bark did not want to hear idle chatter. We're teaching our people just how to conserve. We've set aside land and national preserves. Ninety-five million acres, to be quite precise, have been set aside just to look nice. Well, critters and plants do use this land. It just isn't used by woman or man. Now, breathable air, you've got a point there. We need clean air. For that, there's no spare. But if we examine the scientist's rule, we see that the planet's clean air and its cool depend on young trees in, growing, in tree growing school. That's where they learn how to use CO2 and to make lots of oxygen. Really, it's true. I looked at the guard bark, the gleam in his eye, and I knew we weren't finished, this century and I. As soon as I thought, as soon as that thought was leaving my head, the guard bark spoke. And here's what he said. Biodiversity. Now there is a word. And sciency frog birdie word that I have heard. He thought for a moment, and then he went on. Will this still be here when the trees have been sawn? Discussions where views are debated, so I dug up my facts and quickly I stated. Biodiversity. Hmm, let me see. That word has lots of good meanings for me. In each of our forests, critters abound, leaf snatchers in treetops and lee bugs on a ground. They're snacking and burrowing and packing and scurrowing, their lives always changing. It must be quite harrowing. Cutting those trees sends some critters running, but others move in, some cute and some cunning. They munch on the leaves and they grow on the bark, and none of them loves it more than the pink-spotted lark. A new-cut forest has sun on the ground, and biodiversity leaps and abounds. All kinds of new species move in together, from scales to warts, to fur, from furs to feathers. Then a great thing happened. It made me quite glad. The guard bark calmed down. He was no longer mad. His shoulders relaxed, and he, saw, and he said with a sigh, We want the same things, the tree whacker and I? What about endangered species, my friend? How do we keep them from seeing their end? He looked quite concerned, so I, so I knew he was through being angry at me for the job that I do. I felt he must learn that I'm concerned too. I don't have all the answers, but I gave him my view. That's a tough question. It takes lots of thought to decide what we ought not to do, or we ought. Would anyone mind if we lost, say, a tick that carried a germ that made cuddlebears sick? Or what about something that's really quite nice, like the yellow-striped minnow that lives in Lake Zeiss? How far will we go, how much will we pay, to keep a few minnows from dying away? Do we ever consider just how it would be if we could never ever again cut a tree? Would we live in houses made of plastic and steel till oil and the ores run out? And they will. Then what would happen, after a bit of time passes, to animals that live up, that live in the shrubs and the grasses? With no opening up of the dark forest floor, there'd be no new habitat, no new habitat for them anymore. You know, Mr. Guardbark, I've thought and I've dreamed, I've fumed and I've steamed, I've figured and schemed. I want the best future for my little boy. I want the trees to be here for him to enjoy. 
With that, he looked at me straight in the eye, and he shook my left hand and took to the sky. He said, I am Guardbark, ward of the trees, and I like the way you're managing these. I'm glad we chatted, conversed, and confided. I now think our views aren't quite so one-sided. And perhaps best of all, the guard bark beamed, things are not quite as bad as they seemed. The end.